Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Hotel Investors Marketplace webcast produced by Hotel Brokers International. I'm Diana Alt, President of HBI and Associate Broker of Scoggin Blue LLC, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, Lodging Industry Lookout. While everyone is getting signed in and comfortable, we will highlight a selection of HBI member listings on the screen, and I will share a few items. Founded in 1959, Hotel Brokers International is the leading network of real estate brokers specializing exclusively in hotel real estate investment, providing every phase of the brokerage process from property valuation to closing. Visit HBI on the web at hbihotels.com. If at any time during the webcast you have a question, just click on the Ask a Question button located at the top of the webcast player. Type in your question and submit it. We'll answer as many questions as our time allows. We've also included some attachments and links under the Attachments button. The attachments will be available throughout today's webinar as well as available later today when the recorded event is posted for on-demand viewing at hbishotels.com. We want you to let us know how we're doing, rate today's webcast by clicking on the Rate This button also located at the top of the webcast player. Please feel free to share this webcast by clicking the Share This button. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Jeff Higley. Jeff is a longtime friend of HBI and has specialized in hotel industry journalism for many years. He oversees all aspects of the Hotel News Now digital platform including their website and daily newsletter. Jeff also leads the STR family of companies' efforts with corporate public relations and press releases and frequently writes articles on the lodging in industry. I've known Jeff for a long time. He is a key in the industry, and welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Diana. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Good, good. We were talking before, you know. We've known each other for about 20 years now, so um, I know we've, we've we've seen a couple cycles go through. So I'm uh, eager to see how the next few years pan out, and uh, with this one. So um, I'm just going to get started, and if you need to jump in with questions, feel free to. Okay. So let me see if that works, and there we go. All right, great. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be part of this webinar. I always enjoy my interactions with HBI. It's a great group of people, and, uh, uh, you know, wishing you the best here as uh, the year closes out. Hopefully you make your goals and, uh, and then start off 2017 uh, on, a, on a good note. So uh, good luck with all that. We're going to jump right into the numbers to hopefully give you a little perspective on what's What's coming, uh, what's coming up. Um, as always, our presentations will be available on Hotel News Now. You can see how to get there uh, from our homepage here. Uh, we keep these posted for about 45 days after the event and then take them down. So uh, uh, go in. You have to be a registered user. It's free to, to register. And uh, there are other presentations besides this one that will be posted. This should be up later today or early tomorrow morning at the latest. So we'll get uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, you know, Diana, like we said, we've been around a long time. So so most of you who know me uh, know I have an opinion about pretty much everything, and I'm not <laughs> afraid to share it. Um, so uh, a few things that I think I know. Um, good news, bad news, or bad news, good news. First, it appears that values have peaked. I think probably most of you have seen that uh, in your dealings, uh, but the bid ask is still wide. Uh, you know, sellers are, uh, for the most part, still thinking it's 2015, uh, and and want that um, you know, you'll want those um, 
want those prices while buyers are thinking maybe it's 2008 and they want to pay those prices. So, you know, does that mean more or less business for brokers? Um, that remains to be seen, and of course, I'll be uh, interested to hear what uh, what your members think of of how business is going too. Um, industry consolidation and foreign capital influx will continue. More brands will be trading hands. Uh, you know, we just saw HNA, um, you know, with, with another acquisition, 25% uh, of, of Hilton that'll close sometime next quarter. We, we obviously just saw the huge Marriott uh, acquisition of Starwood. There are a couple of others uh, hanging out there, including um, uh, uh, the uh, HNA acquisition of Carlson and, of course, Red Lion's acquisition of, uh, of Vantage, which went pretty fast. And there's that 15% of Red Lion that HNA owns. So we're seeing this Chinese capital really come, uh, you know, come on shore in the U.S. in a big way. Uh, in a lot of ways, what I'm hearing about that is, is that it's a, the U.S. is providing a safe haven as the Chinese economy tries to figure out where it's going and, um, you know, some, some potential, uh, uh, regulations that are going to be put in place, you know, investors are trying to place their money before that so that they can uh, maximize their returns. Um, so the doomsdayers in the industry are out of touch with Main Street. Um, you know, all we keep hearing out of New York and, and, and the Wall Street firms is, you know, how bad the hotel industry is. Yet in September, it was the first time ever demand surpassed 100 million rooms sold with about 105 million rooms. I don't know. To me, an all-time record of demand for a month like September, that seems to be like maybe the industry is doing a little bit better than what uh, Wall Street would uh, would suggest. Now, later on in this presentation, I'll show you some numbers from New York and, and Houston, and certainly, you know, there are some markets that are suffering a little bit, uh, and, and, you know, New York being one of them, and, you know, the question there becomes, you know, are, are the Wall Street guys so um, uh, affected by just that Manhattan uh, performance that uh, that they may not know what's going on in places, you know, Topeka and otherwise. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, mentality um, takes place uh, or, or continues over the next couple of years. Everywhere I go, owners and operators worrying about the expense line. Um, you know, the cost of running a hotel is obviously not getting any cheaper. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, you've got uh, obviously the employee uh, costs that are going up, and the, and the um, uh, you know, the idea or the notion of of unions coming in strong, unite here coming in strong to uh, to try to assume control of the employees in some of these hotels. The latest thing that I can, that I've heard repeatedly over the past oh, four or five months, if not longer, from hotel owners and operators, is real estate taxes and um, you know the, the improper or or uh, or not up to date assessment of of properties. I'm sure. Uh, all you brokers on the line um, certainly run into that almost probably on a daily or a weekly basis anyway it's uh, it's certainly something that that gives a lot of um, a lot of headaches the other big headache that that appears to be out there is that big supply growth that's going on you can see the the chart here at the uh, the bottom of this um, um, chart where 2016 supply change will be about 1.5 percent when all things are said and done we're projecting at STR that it'll even be higher in 2000 uh, 17, but after that, it looks like it might be leveling off. Um, you know, lenders and developers are backing off. That will dramatically supply growth over the next two, two and a half years, and the lenders are becoming quite um, uh, uh, you know, handcuffed by regulations. And again, I'm sure a lot of you brokers experience this uh, in a big way on a regular basis. That you know, lenders just aren't as free to lend as they they, they once were. And it could be the silver lining that keeps the, uh, the the cycle bouncing along at flat or or above flat. We'll show some numbers that that um, that give you a, an indication of that um, a little bit later as well. And finally, one possible scary trend. I thought you know it's kind of close to Halloween. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, Psycho. Um, you know, some companies aren't providing guidance to analysts during their third quarter earnings calls. Wyndham. You know, they said, ah, we'll get it to you later, analysts. Choice hasn't given guidance in the past couple of, uh, of, of analyst calls. I don't know what to make of that. Are they being secretive? Are they, do they not care what shareholders or, or do they not care what the market thinks of them? It's an interesting trend that's kind of developed uh, that we're going to be watching at Hotel News Now to see if it, um, you know, if it becomes a wider trend. But 
you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens as, uh, you know, as, as shareholder activism becomes, uh, you know, more robust than ever. We see what's going on at, uh, at Felcor, um, you know, with, with the, with the shareholders there kind of demanding a, um, a say, a, a, a sale. Um, so yeah. we'll see how that uh, all takes shape over the next, um, uh, three or four quarters. Yeah, how long will they go? I mean, let it go, so. Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, I suppose it's uh, uh, you know it's all incumbent upon the uh, the share price, and if they start tanking on on the share side uh, on that price per share side, then maybe they'll rethink it. Or if it has no effect, then maybe it's a new trend that uh, that others will adopt as well. Mm-hmm. So we'll get into some numbers now. Um, here's the total U.S. review. You can see September. The numbers uh, uh, came in about a week uh, week or ten days ago. The Jewish calendar shift lifted results. Remember last year the Jewish uh, holidays were in October. This year they moved up to September. So that was a big, uh, certainly one of the reasons that uh, there were record um, uh, room nights sold in in, in September. Revpar up 5.5%, ADR up almost 4%. You know, again, the first time September demand was that high. Group Revpar up 12%. You know, that's probably the silver lining in all of it is that, you know, groups are out there, they're spending some money, and that's certainly something that uh, hotel operators uh, uh, like to see, even if they're not a, a group house, um, you know, getting some of that residual, um, uh, um, you know, business based on, uh, on, on groups in the, in the market. Jeff, I have a question. Somebody put a question. How could profits at franchise company not be high when hotel profits are at record highs? You know, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I, I would think that they're at high levels too. But remember, franchise companies, I think, are feeling a little bit of the heat, you know, particularly from the OTA side of the business. You know, I think there are a lot of owners that are questioning, you know, the value of franchise, the value of brands, um, and, you know, they may be going in and demanding a reduction in fees, and some franchise companies may be more apt to do that than others. Just me speculating. Um, um, but, you know, I think there's a, a, a direct correlation between, um, uh, you know, some of this unrest out there and, and this perception that franchise companies are making a lot of, a lot of money. You know, and really what, the, the whole distribution question, you know, is, is looming over franchise companies and how they, um, uh, how they combat the OTAs and what fees they charge their franchisees in relation to, um, um, you know, the, the reservations they drive. So, um, yeah, I can't answer that specifically of, of you know, what, what the record earnings are or the big earnings are, but certainly there's got to be some, um, let's just call intense conversations going on between the franchisees and the franchisors about those fees, and, and, and certainly that could affect um, those overall profits. Um, so, uh, you know, September, uh, uh, RevPAR up 5.5%, just like old times. You know, I, I won't sing Islands in the Stream uh, like, uh, like Kenny and, and Dolly did. Um, kind of reminds you of what's going on in the election, right? There's some um, uh, a lot of love, lovely uh, uh, words being uh, bannered about. So um, who knows what the effect the election is going to have, uh, if any, um, but it sure uh, – I think we're all ready for it to be over, right? And hopefully that will spur some sort of economic uh, um, uh, upswing because people uh, will go out and spend now that when that once they know, you know, what rules they're going to be playing by. Do you think there's a lot of hesitation because of the elections that they're not spending? A lot of hes- uh, yeah, in buying you know, think, uh, or selling. I think there. I think there's some. Um, uh, some effect of it, sure. I think there's, uh, you know, are we going to have four more years of generally the same type of uh, uh, of mentality in terms of toward the business community? Um, you know, taking all the personalities aside, really, it, be- it becomes, you know, an economic question for people, particularly business owners, small business owners, and many of whom have, have felt that, um, you know, the last eight years was, um, uh, you know, was counterproductive to their business uh, agenda. So yeah, I do. I think some of the uh, um, some of the, 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 the fall off in transactions this year, uh, you know, particularly in the last few months, might be just saying, hey, 
I'm just going to take a wait-and-see approach. We've got the election coming. I want to see how the economy kind of swings. Um, so maybe it's best that I just hold and, and, and see what happens. Um, here, you know, here, we've, here we have the September year-to-date numbers. Uh, occupancy is never higher, 67%. So two out of every three rooms in the country are filled on any given night. Uh, ADR up 3.2% three, 3 um, year-to-date. RevPAR up 3.2% as well. You can see the supply and demand equation um, about equal. Uh, and that's really the one I watch. And there's a little bit of a, a – there's a chart coming up that, that, that really uh, shows this well, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, here's quarterly RevPAR percent change. Slow is the new normal. You can see kind of the teal bar. Uh, on the right side for the first three quarters of this year, uh, you know, significantly lagging um, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so uh, is it a slowdown? Yes. Is it a drop off the cliff? Not by any means. Um, I, oh, I was at the uh, uh, Dallas Hotel Conference, uh, what was that, two weeks ago? Last week? I don't know. <laughs> Traveling so much, I'm not sure what city I'm in. Uh, but um, – you know, at that conference, I think, you know, it was echoed again that, hey, if we're only getting 3% RevPAR growth, there are a lot of industries that would kill to have that kind of uh, of growth for one of their, you know, key metrics. So, you know, I think there's a general um, uh, a general thought that, hey, if things if things bounce around, bounce along here at the uh, at the flat to 3% growth rate, we'll, we'll we'll be okay. Here's, the, here's the, the, the slide I was talking about. If you look here, the demand is in red, the supply is in, uh, the, these are percentage growth. Our, uh, demand is in blue, supply is in red. And if you look back historically, when the red um, uh, go, dips, pardon me, when the blue dips below the red is typically when there's a, a downturn in the industry. And we are getting precariously close to, uh, to that happening. Um, I wrote a, a, a blog a few weeks ago. I think that's going to happen. I think we'll dip sometime in July or August of next year when the old, when the year-to-year -year comps during the peak season are so tough to com to, to meet that uh, we'll start seeing some negative RevPAR um, numbers. It may not be dramatic. It may be 1%, um, but I think that's when my personal feeling is, is that's when the, when the dip will take place. Uh, here's another uh, similar chart where occupancy change and, and ADR percent change. Uh, you know, they've been kind of going hand in hand um, uh, over the past, uh, you know, what, what's that, probably, uh, you know, two years. Um, so that's a good sign, uh, you know, as long as ADR can stay, uh, you know, again, in that 3% range, I think most hotel owners are uh, are okay with that if this is considered the, quote, downturn. Uh, we're at 79 months of RevPAR growth, and you can see the record. Uh, we should hit that in November of 80 consecutive months. Um, you know, we had that uh, dip there. If you look, where 80 and 31 are kind of – there's a little dip in there. That was the March uh, – uh, I think that was the, uh, the, the one of the bubbles in 97. Um, that uh, that dropped off there. Otherwise, you know, that would have been a significantly longer period of time. Um, you know. The thing here is, is again, uh, you know, I'll probably sound like a broken record uh, throughout this um, at times, but you know, that rev park growth is still significantly above that zero line. So this, you know, this could reach 85 to 90 months before we start, uh, or at least before I start worrying that we're going to see it come to an end. We'll take a look at some of the uh, the chain scales here. Um, you can see, you know, here's an example of what we classify some of the, the chain scales and the brands that go in them. You can download the entire list at this um, at the address in red down at the bottom. So with that as a background, looking here, you know, demand growth is not quite keeping pace with supply growth, but look in that upscale segment, you know, that's where the supply is monstrous. But demand is kind of keeping up with it there, and I'm going to I'm going to go back one slide just so you can remember. You know, in that upscale, you've got Garden Inn, you've got Courtyard, uh, you know, you know, Residence Inn, Homewood Suites. You know, those very high growth brands from Marriott and, and Hilton are really uh, leading the way there. 
seems to me that there's not a day that goes by that I don't get a press release that says, hey, a new Garden Inn's opening here or, uh, you, you know, uh, a new – any kind of upscale property is opening somewhere. So, so that's, a, you know, that's obviously driving a lot of the numbers is that upscale segment. You can even see where, uh, you know, demand has dipped over there in the economy segment um, year over yeah, year. Yeah, why has it dipped and September. independents are up? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think – and we'll see a slide up ahead where we look at um, uh, location segments. And interstate locations have surprisingly been pretty weak um, comparatively mm -hmm. to the other locations. So, you know, my, my deduction there is, is that a lot of those economy highway hotels are really taking, uh, you know, taking a hit right now. Ooh, let's see. High-end hotels still very busy. Um, you can see luxury, upper upscale, and upscale. You know, well, you know, well over 75%. So three out of every four of those rooms are filled every night, and then it kind of tears down uh, uh, from there. Um, you know, with upper mid scale and 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 even the economy. Um, you know, which had that demand um, uh, uh, demand fall off a little bit, there's still, you know, the record number of travelers is keeping occupancy, at least, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of being flat. This slide's, uh, you know, 320 bucks a night for luxury hotels. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty good, um, um, that's a pretty good day for, for anybody. Um, and then how they all fall in, uh, um, uh, accordingly down the line uh, in each of the chain scales. Um, so, you know, it's obviously a, um, a very uh, lucrative time for the luxury segment. You know, they, they, it grew pretty dramatically after 2008 and, uh, and has been able to hold its own. What will be interesting to watch over the next 12 months is how that, you know, if that stays flat or if those luxury hotels are eventually going to have to, uh, um, you, know, you know, start coming down a little bit. And you know, I'll say the dreaded words. I hope we don't see another like AIG effect. Or you guys all remember that, you know, in the in the in the heat of the downturn when AIG spent a lot of money at a Four Seasons, and you know, all hell broke loose. Uh, I mean, people were saying don't travel. I mean, there there were there were hotels that took resorts out of their names because they didn't want to be classified as that, and um, because they were getting so much bad uh, publicity. So hopefully it will never go back to that bad, but right now, you know, things are looking pretty good, you know, in particular in that luxury segment for that ADR. Uh, here we're starting to get into some of those uh, uh, locations, so urban locations. I don't think this is to anyone's surprise um, that urban locations, both supply and demand, uh, you know, are driving the ship here. Um, you know, every conference I go to, every interview I do, uh, so at some point, it's all about being in an urban billboard location. Um, and that really came out of this last downturn, you know, in a hurry. Um, you know, in 09 and 10 when things were slow, then all of a sudden this urban, um, um, what's the word, uh, you know, this love for urban properties uh, and in the, in the select service um, uh, arena. Uh, you know, how many Garden Inns, how many uh, Hampton Inns, uh, et cetera, do you see – Jumping into that urban uh, environment, and, and, and they can, and consumers are happy with that because they can pay a, a quote reasonable price and still have all the amenities around them. So, um, you know, that that to me has been the, the biggest um, uh, change in the industry since the downturn is that select service dominance of of the supply chain going into. Uh, uh, into urban areas. It's been uh, truly amazing to watch um, and because obviously the, to build those, the cost per key, in many cases, you know, it's a rehab of an old building, although there are a number of new builds as well. It's just, uh, you know, it's just uh, uh, what I what I have the biggest pro trouble understanding is how these brands have conditioned consumers to go from, you know, and I don't want to pick on Hampton Inn, but I'll pick on Hampton Inn, um, you know, to go from a predominantly, you know, suburban highway location where guests, you know, free parking, et cetera. Now you go to an urban Hampton Inn and you have to pay $37 a night for parking, but 
you know, the, the brands are so strong that, that the consumers are okay with doing that because they want to be at that brand. You know, I think that's been a phenomenal uh, success story for the brands to, uh, to educate consumers in that regard. But suburban locations generate more rev par. You can see the rev par and, and, and room revenues uh, um, for each of those. Um, you know, I was talking about the um, interstate locations a little while ago with the, with the economy. You can see where rev par is just barely above flat, uh, and, and room you know room revenue is significantly lower than all of the other uh, location segments. So it's those interstate those interstate locations that seem to have be the ones that are taking the brunt of uh, you, you, you know, any bad news that we have uh, in, in this particular part of the cycle. So we'll turn to a little bit of segmentation. Um, you know, that's uh, group versus transient. You can see where uh, the ADR percent change on transient growth uh, intersected with demand change, and now ADR growth is below demand growth. I think that's a signal that things are starting to slow down dramatically. Uh, if, uh, if hotels aren't, let me rephrase that, if hotels don't have the ability to maintain a rate on transient business above demand, uh, their demand percent growth, uh, you know, I think, I think that's a sign that, that hotel operators are getting a little bit um, um, nervous and are starting to lower rates. And as we all know, that's something that, um, you know, that, that really contributed to the last downturn was that, uh, that on the street corner level, one person lowers a rate, then it's a domino effect. So mm -hmm. we'll be watching that pretty closely to see how that, um, that trend goes over the next uh, several months. Uh, group demand uh, growth slows. Uh, September, kind of an outlier there, as we talked about with the Jewish holidays. Um, but, you know, prior to September, it was a pretty much, a, you know, drop every month uh, for the past year um, uh, in group demand growth. So to, to at least have that reprieve for one month, I think people maybe breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief. The good news about all of that is just the opposite of what I talked about before, where you have this demand percent change dropping, but hotels have been able to hold the group ADR pretty strong. Now, a lot of that is obviously driven by contracts that were signed, you know, 18, 24, 36, 60 months ago. So, you know, it'll, it, it'll bear watching to see how those contract negotiations go for the next few years. Right now, what people are, are telling me is that uh, the, uh, the, the upper hand is now going back to the buyer, not the hotel. So, uh, there's more leverage from the group perspective in terms of what they can demand from the hotel in rate uh, and amenities. So another trend uh, to worth uh, that bears watching. And just a quick, uh, here's how the uh, actual ADR by consumers, by customer segment and transient and group business has grown over the past, um, you know, eight. No, oh, that's ten years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a nice stair-step approach. Uh, we'll see if that levels off next year. Um, you know, I think this – I think if you look at this, um, you know, this, this, this is the one slide that tells the story of the success of the industry and how it's progressed over the past decade since, uh, you, know, you know, since that downturn, big downturn hit in 08 and early 09 and how it's – how the industry has, um, you know, you know picked itself up by the bootstraps and, and, and recovered, and you'll note the stronger recovery on the transient side as opposed to the group side, in large part because of those long-term contracts uh, signed so far in advance in 08, 09, and 10, even 11, you know, the, the buyer was, uh, they were in control, and, uh, and, and that's bared out through these, uh, through these numbers. Take a quick look at the transaction almanac, which we do, in, uh, you know, uh, we have a great partnership with HBI on that. So here's a, a couple slides with the numbers. You know, this is the one that I'm sure it hurts all of you guys the most. Look at that right side and, and, and you know, the, um, the number of uh, the, the transaction volume, $7.2 uh, billion uh, up to, you know, through September of this year. Um, 
way down. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can say anything else. I feel, you know, I feel for you guys. <laughs> um, and, you know, hopefully, as we talked about before, that we can start seeing, you know, we'll start seeing a little bit of a different approach once this whole economy, election uncertainty is behind us. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe there's more, a little more realism in the buyers, in the, in the bid ask gap. And uh, we can, uh, you, know, you know, start putting some more of those properties uh, in different hands, and and you guys can, um, you know, start making mo- more money again. That's that's what we're all open. We hope. But there's nobody that objects to that on this call, I don't think, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, average price per room holds steady. So even, you know, I guess in the good. A good way to look at it is even with the dramatic drop in the number, the volume of, of transactions, the prices are holding steady per room at $240,000 per room nationwide. Obviously, that's market-driven, uh, whether it's higher or lower than that. Um, but, you know, at least it's holding steady uh, in, in that regard. And then last but not least, uh, the investment per room increases a bit. And this is the total investment of, of the acquisition plus any CapEx improvements. So it's up to 200, almost about $280,000 per room um, for, um, you know, for transaction. So, uh, you know, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, so, you know, I think we're, you, you, you know, you guys all deal with PIPs and, 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 and all those negotiations through all the deals that you make. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's what, what's driving, what's driven all of this uh, increase in the last few years is, you know, the demand for the PIPs has really become um, um, paramount for the brands. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we'll take so a what, look at wait, the – I have a question. Oops, what segment? Sure. I mean, because those numbers, is that just an overall um, averaging all the different segments for this price? Or where did have yeah, that – yeah, that's 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 everything all in. Um, um, you know, we we do uh, have a quarterly. Uh, you guys, most of you know Steve Hennis. You know, he keeps track of all this stuff for us, and and he provided these slides. And 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 I know, I think year end he really um, that's when he breaks down all of the um, you know by segment and whatnot. So okay. you know, that those numbers will be coming out uh, probably shortly after the first of the year. Um, but yeah, the, this is just represents the big picture. Okay, thank you. So we'll take a look at a few markets here. Um, new supply, uh, you can see, uh, um, you know, we, we've seen Nashville, we've seen uh, New York, Houston, Miami. You know, these, particularly New York, Houston, and Miami, they've always been the, you know, among the leaders uh, of this. And, and, and now basically what we have here at the top are the top five of the top 25 markets, and at the bottom are the bottom five in terms of ADR percent change. And you can see New York, Houston, and Miami are all um, are all down in that bottom five. And we'll show some numbers here in a minute about uh, supply, and, and you know it's not not hard to see uh, why. What fascinates me is still if you look at New York's occupancy of 85 percent. But their ADR is dropping. Uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you're basically running. Uh, I mean, sure, it's not completely full, but you're running a pretty full house every night, and you're still giving up rate. Now, you know, the big question there is obviously: is there, a, you know, is Airbnb having an effect? Um, uh, in, in, you know, uh, the, the numbers that we've put on. I don't have any numbers in these uh, in this slide deck, but um, you know, has shown you know that that really. Because of compression nights, there's not a lot of effect on that ADR. Now, there may be effects otherwise. We're strictly looking at it by the numbers. Um, and the numbers don't indicate, um, you, know, that, 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 you know, that there should be this kind of a drop you know, based on compression nights and everything else. It still goes back to that argument of 85%, you should be able to hold, hold, hold the rate. And to a certain degree, if you have Miami at 78%, you know, remember going back to one of the very first slides, nationwide, 67% occupancy, and that's an all-time high. Yet these markets are well outperforming those, uh, the national average, but yet can't hold the rate. Um, 
like to get a couple of GMs or, uh, over a couple drinks sometime off the record and, and learn the, the, the real story behind that. Um, so, yes, Houston, now top supply growth percentage-wise, um, you know, uh, in the room supply percent change year to date. So you can see that on the right-hand side and then all the way down uh, through the top 25 markets. But yet, if you look on that far right for Houston, then the next slide, yeah, demand. demand. Houston's way over there on the left. Uh, so they're putting in a lot more rooms in Houston, and demand is way off, and we all know why, that oil, uh, uh, you know, the oil recession that's going on, um, you know, it, it, it's a very precarious situation uh, um, in Houston. Um, and again, I'm going to go back to you know, kind of New York, which is over there again, way on the far right. So it's the leader of the top 25. So they're leading demand. They have 87 or 85.1 percent occupancy, yet their rate is going down. Yeah. The average daily rate is going down. To me, that just still it doesn't make sense that there's an external factor that big that could affect that. It seems to me that there's some sort of of disconnect. Um, you know, on the uh, on the revenue management side, it's not taking advantage of this, you know, this this five percent demand growth or whatever it is. So, you know, summing up Houston performance, terrible. All right, that's it. <laughs> you know, demand, uh, you know, has fallen uh, underneath. The, you know, you know, dramatically. Uh, crew, you know, and uh, look, there's no secret that the demand and the correlation to crude oil prices, uh, you know, go hand in hand. So um, yeah. it's just it's not pretty down there, um, you know. And, and it obviously is a concern that there's so much new supply coming in, um, and, and what's that going to mean? You know, I think to a certain degree that could benefit um, um, the brokers like you all on the line in terms of. As you know, it's, it's usually not the first guy that makes money on a hotel. It's the second guy, right, or the third guy even, so or woman. And, um, you know, that means brokers, you'll be stepping in and helping facilitate these sales to the people that are going to make the money. Um, you know, whether that's a distressed situation or not in terms of price, that remains to be seen. I'll be, I'll be eager to hear from you guys as time goes on how that, uh, uh, you know, how that all pans out on the price side. And then you look at New York monthly rev par change. It is all bad all the time this year. Um, you know, you look, you know, March it was up, but other than that, um, you know, for the past 12 months it's been nothing but um, declining. So, you know, it kind of goes back to one of those early points. All those Wall Street guys, all those investment banker types keep seeing these kind of numbers. And, you know, because New York is the center of the universe for them, they think that equates everywhere, and as some of these numbers have shown, that's not necessarily true. Um, but I think uh, you know that whole uh, uh, doomsday um, uh, mentality stems from this slide right here and those like it. We'll take a look at the pipeline here. Uh, you can see, you know, I think there's going to be a time when we look back and on this slide. You know, four years from now, go, yep, that was the time. That was when overbuilding started to take place. Because when you have a 35% increase in the number of rooms in construction, you know, that's pretty scary. Um, so, you know, there's 178,000 rooms in construction. By comparison, I think if you remember, um, you know, in those uh, 05, 06 days, um, I believe it was somewhere in the 200 to 215,000 rooms, so we're slowly creeping up. Um, now, the good news is, is that planning those that actually have, you know, contracts in place and are the final planning stage, it drops off precipitously about a third. But then you start seeing these planning ones that, in a lot of cases, are just gleams in somebody's eye right now, are starting to creep up again. So. Um, We'll see if they get financing. I don't believe they, uh, that, that, that that many will, and I think that's where we'll start seeing after 2018 we'll start seeing this level off, you know, particularly the construction and, and new openings um, numbers will, will go dramatically down after that. 
Right, because in construction, because of the oil here in Texas and the gas that has, there was a development of a lot of hotels. I'm sure that's going to probably stop soon, too, I would think. Correct? Yeah, you know, I, I can't think. I mean, if you, if how do I put it? For the most part, if 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 you have a if you have a construct if you have a project that's in construction or in the final planning, you know, yeah, you move forward with it. Right. I don't. I'm not sure there's anybody that would put a dirt or put a shovel in the dirt now based on the current economy and you know in Texas, particularly you know Harris County or you know around the Houston area. That just seems counterintuitive to me. But with that said. You know, there's always those developers who that's the time that they build is, you know, in the depths of a, uh, of a downturn and then come out of it with new, uh, you know, with the newest um, uh, inventory on the block. And that, you know, that helps when things go better. So, uh, you know, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find those guys right now, but uh, I suspect there's somebody out there that would do that. Um, so we talked a little bit before about the chain scales and, uh, you know, particularly the upscale segment. So, you know, two-thirds of the rooms in construction, under construction right now, are in that upscale and upper mid-scale segment. So, again, the courtyards, the Hamptons, the Garden Inns, uh, the Holiday Inn Expresses fall into that category, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, that's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of rooms under construction. Um, uh, and of course, you've got that unaffiliated over here on the far right side, about 23 percent, or pardon me, 23,000 uh, rooms that have yet to be affiliated. You know, probably half of those uh, will become, you know, distributed throughout that uh, the other segments. More than likely, in the upscale or upper mid scale, they just haven't found the brand yet. Um, you know, they're waiting for uh, uh, the Marriott Starwood us to settle to see what brands are, are going to be available in particular markets. A lot of numbers here, uh, but these are the top 26 markets. 23 of them have 2% plus uh, of existing supply uh, uh, in the pipeline. Again, that's kind of a it kind of makes you nervous. So, 15% of the existing supply is in the pipeline right now uh, for for New York. So, that's an additional 16,500 rooms. 16,500 rooms. Wow. And yet, they're not able to hold their rate. So, these developers are coming in and just kind of exacerbating the situation, you know, by adding these rooms and, and, and perhaps, um, you know, further, um, um, you know, jeopardizing the ability to raise rates. But being my own devil's advocate, they're at 85% occupancy. That means there's a demand there, right? So, um, you know, it's a, it truly is a, a remarkable market, um, you know, as I think it was – Dave Johnson from Ambridge uh, at the Dallas conference, I mean, he put it, I think he, he summed it up best. He said, uh, yeah, it's a bloodbath. <laughs> and that pretty much essentially is, is what it is. But when you look at Seattle and Denver, they're also in double digit percentage wise for supply growth. Uh, and even Nashville at almost 10%, you know, it's added so much supply. When is enough going to be enough? When will the tipping point be reached in, in, in Nashville? Uh, and it doesn't appear to be anytime soon. You know, most of you know that STR headquarters are in the Nashville area in Hendersonville. So I go down there quite frequently, and um, my favorite football team, the winless Cleveland Browns, um, was playing in Nashville, and I was going to go. I went down for business, but I was there on the weekend, so I tried to stay downtown. 450 bucks for a courtyard, a room at a courtyard or at a garden inn. Um, so they're they're still getting um, they're getting rate um, even with the influx. The new Westin just opened, you know, adding uh, several hundred rooms. The Omni opened a couple years ago or 18 months ago with with um, with, with 800 rooms. Uh, so you know, some some markets are defying logic, and, and I think Nashville is one of them. But this does overall kind of paint a picture of. Yeah, things are getting, um, you know, a little bit uh, frothy, I guess, on the construction side with so many markets, um, you know, adding 2% or more uh, to, their, to their inventory. 
uh, well, I have theoretically. A too, it's sure. like some of the franchises, you know, they don't want three stories. Now they want four stories. You know, they're changing a lot in what they want for their property. So I know some of here in the Dallas area, so instead of losing the flag, they're building another property, you know, so that they're with their, you know, the four stories or whatever is needed. And then their right. other hotel, they're just going to change the flag. Well, that's going to bring more hotels in too, correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, you know, there's, there are a number of brands that over the past, uh, gosh, probably 20 years, you know, starting with you know Holiday Inn, even, um, you know, when 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 they look at a, a, a property that may be what they consider obsolete, you know, they give the first right of refusal to that existing owner. You build a new one that meets our. Uh, you know our brand standards as they stand now, um, and oh, the ten you know, years. Yeah. yeah, or you don't build it, you're going to lose your flag, and we'll let somebody else build it. So it's up to you. Um, right. You know, and so what does you know what does that owner do? Well, there are certain brands in this industry that at this point in time are are relative cash cows, and you know they're going to build. And if that, if that means you know they have to have thirty percent um, suites. So they have to go up a floor. They have to push out, um, you know, push the footprint out. Um, that's uh, that's what they'll do. Um, so, but that does add that inventory. And then what happens to that old hotel? You know, what brand is it put on? Um, you know, and in large part, you're, you know, the membership of HBI has a large uh, large hand in saying, you know, determining that, you know, and in, in helping negotiate with the with the brands um, that would. You know, that would take over that hotel, uh, you know, as a flag. So, uh, so yeah, you're right, Diana. I mean, you know, just it's, you know, it's this, you know, if you want to call it amenity creep or or size creep or you know, whatever. Um, yeah, brands are going through that because you know they're upgrading what their offerings are. That's what their customers are telling them they want. Um, you know, there are some select service brands uh, with their new prototypes that. Could be borderline full service with just a tweak, you know. I mean, they're that um, they're that elaborate. Um, so it, it is interesting to watch that dynamic. You know, I'm not the first person to say this. I had, somebody said it in the early '90s or before. It's not overbuilt; it's under demolished, and that's kind of what we're seeing. You know, there are 5.2 million hotel rooms in the U.S. now. Um, you know, when I first started in '96. You know, I think that was 2.8 million. So the just the growth of the industry has been just, and obviously dr led and and driven by uh, you know the brand mentality. You know, and, and 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 to me it's kind of funny because all the brands now are saying you know they want to offer unique experiences, um, and and you know they go to, you know, to, to the great extremes to do that, but you know. Can you get an experience at a, at a brand that has a thousand properties? I suppose you can, um, but I'm not sure it's unique. Pipeline for uh, the top 26 markets. Um, the slide, all those before, represent uh, almost half of the rooms under construction in the uh, uh, in the U.S. itself. So you can see uh, in construction, uh, um, 84, almost 85,000 uh, rooms. Uh, in those top 26 markets, and then 93 and a half thousand the rest of the U.S. So truly, it's those top 26 markets that really do, um, you, know, you know, dictate the course of the hotel industry throughout the U.S. Okay, we're kind of uh, getting toward the end here. So looking at um, at the forecast, uh, here's our forecast for 2016 and 2017. You know, I would still call this somewhat bullish. Uh, you know. Um, You've got that demand um, still at one and a half percent. You know the big red flag there is that two percent supply growth that we for, we're forecasting for next year. I mean that is the one that I think has everybody. Um, you know that's the first time in boy I, I can't a decade or so that 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 supply growth is above the twenty year average. 
20-year average is about 1.8, 1.9% for supply growth. So we're going to see that for 20, you know, in, in 2017, it's going to go past that. And I think that has a lot of people scared um, in terms of what to do with their properties, you know, how their own local market is affected by that, what's coming in, you know, across the street or, or um, you know, on the, on the other corner of the, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the interstate. So, um, you know, I think these these numbers, again, I think bear out that we're in, a, we're in an industry that's kind of in, in transition, and we're not sure what the transition is going to be, what it's going to morph into. Um, but, again, I will repeat it, uh, and, and, you know, every owner-operator that I've talked to said, look, if, if you're telling me the downturn is going to be, you know, you know two and a half, three percent rev par growth, then I'm okay with that. Now we'll see how we'll see if that lasts, uh, you know, for the long term. But for right now, that's at least pacifying people to think, okay, we can weather this storm as long as there's not some black swan, you know, horrible event that, um, you know, that that that, you know, that drops the performance off the cliff. And then we're looking here by by um, chain scale uh, for the 2016 year end outlook. You can see uh, you can see those numbers and and. You know, kind of look at that, um, uh, you know, the upscale uh, segment. You know, when you're looking at ADR, it's pretty clear across the board, um, and, and likewise with RevPar. So you know, it's pretty, um, you know, these numbers, are obviously, after nine months, you know, we've got a good feel of what's going to come in uh, at the end of the year. So we're pretty uh, feeling pretty good about this. And, you know, 3.2% 3, 3, 3. uh on ADR and RevPAR growth at the end of the year is, is not a horrible thing. Same thing for 2017. Um, you know, uh, a little less in RevPAR, about the same in ADR, and a little less in occupancy. So, you know, I guess you could say, um, you know, um, even or thereabouts, you know, is, is the new success story. And then uh, I think kind of to round it out here, we've got uh, – um, you know, the year-end forecast rev par for uh, you know, the top 25 markets. Sorry, Houston, you do have a problem, uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's pretty substantial, uh, and it's going to affect rev par pretty dramatically. And you've got these, you know, the, 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 the other three uh, uh, problem child, problem children, uh, and then, you know, majority of them in the middle there, 0 to 5%, and a, and a few of them above, uh, up to 10%. So, um uh, uh, you can see that for the most part we're we're, some, we're, we're fairly bullish on the uh, on the markets um, and the rev par performance. And then same thing for 2017. Um, it kind of uh, uh, levels out a little bit with Houston coming back in a little bit. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine following a really bad year with another really bad year for Houston. So we hope you know it's not as bad. And then the majority fall into that zero, you know, flat to a little bit above uh, uh, growth uh, that I've been uh, kind of hammering home throughout the throughout the last hour or so. Whew. So there you have it. Um, certainly happy to answer any other questions you have, Diana. Or uh, yeah, if talk anybody about, has any uh, questions. You know, talk about the Indians winning the World Series tonight. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I've only waited five, on waited 45 years, so it's time. Yes. Well, good luck. Also, um, Jeff, wanted to let you know, HBI transactions third quarter year, year to date are actually equal in number to all of 2015. Because you know, you were talking about oh, sweet. now's the time, so that's good. HBI is expecting a 25 to 33 percent increase in 2016. Overlapped. Congratulations! That's great news. That's that. Yeah. You know, that's you know. I mean, I know a lot of your members. And I know you know, hardworking and 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 you know, with lots of context. That's great news. I'm really happy to hear that. So anyway, does anybody have any other questions? I guess not. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Uh, have a great rest of the year, everybody. A successful uh, uh, rest of the year. Uh, happy holidays. And um, I think I'll see you guys in February um, at, at your conference out in Vegas. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Well, i got to jump off. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye.
Bye. Don't forget to rate today's webcast by clicking the Rate This button located at the top of the webcast player. If you can download a PDF list of today's featured hotel listings plus a selection of additional hotel investment assets listed by HBI broker members under the Attachments button on the top of the webcast player. Click on the Share This button to share today's webinar with your colleagues. And remember, this and previous Hotel Investors Marketplace webcasts are available for on-demand viewing at hbihotels.com. Before we go, I'd like to remind you of our industry calendar. HBI will exhibit at the Vantage International Educational Conference and Trade Show being held in Las Vegas on December 5th through the 8th. We will also exhibit at the Alice Conference in Los Angeles in January, on January 23rd to the 25th. If you are attending either event, please look us up. Thanks for watching and have a great day.